Caribbean Court of Justice, Appellate Jurisdiction, on appeal from the Court of Appeal of Guyana, CCJ application number one of 2018, between Mark Fraser versus the state for the hearing of the application for special leave. Can we have the appearances for the court, please? Thank you. Send the congratulations of the Bar Association and its members to Honorable Mr. Justice Jamada on his ascension to this August bench. We anticipate and expect his innovative and creative style of jurisprudence will add to the court's continued delivery of justice to the people of the Caribbean. And the DPP and I are available for the ice cream bar to celebrate. That's how you are. My name is Kamal Rampran and I am here for the applicant. Please, Your Honors. I'm Shalimar Ali Haku, Director of Public Prosecutions, and I appear together with Mrs. Obain, the Assistant Director of Public Prosecutions. And I would like, on behalf of myself and the staff of the Deep Peace Chambers, to congratulate Justice Jamadar on his ascension to the highest court for Guyana in the region. And we look forward to your knowledge and experience and benefiting from it at this level. Congratulations, please, Your Honor. Yes, thank you very much, Counsel. Um, Justice Chamberlain, I don't know if whether you wanted to respond. No. Okay. Um, Mr. Ramkaran? May it please, Your Honors. The task for special leave to appeal under Section 8 of the Caribbean Court of Justice has been the subject of much refinement recently by Your Honors. It may be that Mr. Fraser has to establish that he has suffered a serious miscarriage of justice, or that there has been an egregious error of law, or that he has good prospects of success. It may also be that the court can exercise its discretion to permit him leave to appeal because the Court of Appeal incorrectly refused leave as of right, since he raises a genuinely disputable question of redress for breach of his fundamental right to a fair hearing within a reasonable time. Yes, sir. That last mentioned point, is, does that come out of our own jurisdiction or is that your gloss? The previous ones, I think, came out of our, our jurisdiction, but I'm a little surprised that we might have said that um, if you have an appeal as of right and you are wrongly refused um, leave to appeal, that you automatically should succeed in an application for special leave. No, sir. It comes out of my gloss. It comes from the fact that the court has a discretion to grant special leave or not. And the court has said that that discretion is exercised on a case-by-case -case basis, and it is developing its jurisprudence. It also comes from the discussion in LOP and the Amrara Bank, LOP and the Amrara Bank number one, where the genuinely disputable question of breach of fundamental right was discussed, but there was no conclusion on it. So it is my gloss based on the court's general jurisprudence. I know, Your Honor, that this application for special leave is not an appeal from the application before the Court of Appeal is a fresh application for special leave to be considered on its own merits. But whichever test the court prefers, the answer to whether Mr. Fraser should be allowed to appeal in my submission, Your Honors, can be found from a single question. And that question is, did Mark Fraser receive a fair trial? If we were to combine all the disparate parts of... Oh. When you say a fair trial, you mean a trial at the High Court? I mean, Your Honor, from the first day, Saturday the 26th of October, that he went into the police station and was kept for three days, up until the Court of Appeal refused leave. Everything that happened between those two events, a fair, the whole 
process of trial, was the whole process of trial fair. Okay. And, Your so Honor, I... Whether he was treated fairly, not yes, whether sir. he received a fair trial. Whether the trial state... was reserved to a hearing at a court. Yes, sir. Well, what I really mean is a process. Okay. The process of trial. Whether the state has discharged its obligation to its citizen, Mark Fraser, to protection of the law. And, well, Your Honor, has taken me a bit further. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Proceed in your own logical. So I was saying, Your Honor, if we were to combine all the disparate parts of the case and look at the entire trial process, the question becomes easy to answer. With respect, uh, Mr. Harankaran, you, 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 you have me a bit, um, you, you, you have me a bit disoriented here. Yes, sir. Because what we are looking at is what took place in the Court of Appeal. Yes, sir. Yeah? Well, Your Honor, what happened in the Court of Appeal was that Mr. Fraser's conviction was upheld. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Fraser's conviction could not have been upheld if the Court of Appeal had considered his right to a fair hearing in an open and extended sort of way. A not, fair not just hearing before the Court of Appeal itself or a fair hearing at the trial level? Well, Your Honor, I have not argued this before, but if Your Honor permit me leave to appeal, I want to put all of the errors, including the errors at trial, the substantive errors of law, as well as the procedural irregularities which happened at trial, under one large umbrella of a fair hearing. In, in doing so, Your Honor, I am following the jurisprudence established by Justice Witt in a number of cases, starting from the Queen against Boyce and Joseph, Boyce and Joseph against the Queen, uh, Nervé and Severin in 2018, um, August against the Queen in his dissenting judgment, uh, Salazar and the Queen, which last Friday. I'm following a trend developed by this court to look at the the constitutional right, the, the rule of law requirement that the process of trial must be fair. And if it is not fair, then the court must do something about it. So that, I want to put them all under the overarching umbrella of fair trial process. I don't know if Your Honors will permit me to do so, but no, go ahead. nevertheless, we, we are not I, I, yet. I think, I think what you need to do is to focus on getting special leave now. Yes, sir, yeah. but of course, if <laughs> If there is a miscarriage of justice on any one of the multiple grounds that are before that were before the Court of Appeal, then Mr. Fraser should be permitted special leave to appeal. Okay. Your Honours, in order to determine whether there has been a substantial miscarriage of justice which would enable Mr. Fraser to appeal to this court, one has to look, as I have submitted, at everything that was before the Court of Appeal to determine whether on any one single ground or in a combination of all of the grounds or on delay alone, whether Mr. Fraser's conviction could have been quashed. And at this stage, at the application for special leave, it is my submission that the ground just has to be arguable. It just has to be a ground which is not bound to fail before this court. And it will establish that there may have been a substantial miscarriage of justice because if there is any reason, any reason at all, that would lead your honors to the conclusion that Mr. Fraser could possibly have had his conviction quashed, and there has been a substantial miscarriage of justice. The words substantial miscarriage of justice sound like a very high standard to reach, but what else could they mean other than this conviction, which has been imposed on Mr. Fraser, is unfair and should be set aside? They couldn't mean anything else, Your Honors. They have to mean that. The bar could not be so high that the heavens had to fall before you could determine that there was a substantial miscarriage of justice. 
Uh, the, the point you uh, seem to make in the submission or in the, uh, in the application is that, okay, there was unfairness during the trial. Yes, Your Honor. Certain mistakes were made by the trial judge, etc. Uh, that could clearly have an effect on the safety of the conviction. Yes, sir. But I think you mainly focusing uh, on what happened after that. So there was an enormous delay. Yes, sir. And the question is then, okay, how can that affect the safety of what went before? Understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So. I think you would have to persuade us that what happened because of that delay has retroactively its effect on the safety of that conviction that happened before the inf infringement of the fair trial or reasonable time provision. If you could focus on, on that. But if we look, sir, at the delay itself, without the effect of the delay, just at the delay itself, the length of time. <laughs> I am sure that it will not be difficult for your honors to conclude that it was an unusual and inexplicable delay. It was 11 years, 8 months, and 2 days between the, conviction The Court of Appeal and agreed appeal. with that. Yes, sir. But they gave, uh, they gave as redress. They uh, agreed, sir, but at the end of the day, Mr. Fraser is still convicted of manslaughter, which he will have to carry for the rest of his life. Yes. Although there are numerous other errors in addition to the delay. Now, not only the length of time between conviction and appeal, sir, if you look at the length of time between the incident and the, the uh, and today, it's 16 years, 8 months, and 22 days ago mm -hmm. this happened. Mr. Fraser was a 19-year-old private. This court was not in existence 16 years ago, sir. So if you put that length of time into context and you add to it the complaints that Mr. Fraser has had, that it affected his grounds of appeal. So on the one hand, the delay is unacceptable. This court in Harichan and Singh and then in the later case, the, the case on the, on delay has said that delay by itself is unacceptable and an unexplained delay is unacceptable and cannot be permitted. If you want to just permit me a moment to get that case up. Bridgelal, Your Honors. In Bridgelal, your Honor Justice Saunders said that in considering whether there has been a breach of the reasonable time guarantee, it is for appropriate to first consider the overall period of time that, that has elapsed. And if the period appears to be overly lengthy, then it would be appropriate for the court to interrogate all the relevant facts and circumstances with a view to determining whether the state has provided a satisfactory explanation or justification for any lapse of time. Now, in Bridge Law, Your Honors, the delay was six years between, I think, the incident and the appeal, was six years. In, in this case, it's far longer. And in this case, it has been established, I believe, by Mr. Fraser, that he has been affected by this delay. It's not just the length of time that he's been sitting around waiting for his case to be called. But even if it was just the length of time he had been sitting around waiting for his case to be called, he has been oppressed oppressed by the fact that he has a conviction and he may go to jail. So there is that oppression. But in addition to that oppression, there is also the fact that that delay affected his grounds of appeal. So the first ground of appeal it affected was what the prosecutor told the jury on the risk to be foreseen. Did she say that the risk to be foreseen was injury or did she say it was death? Mr. Fraser contends that she said about five times or more that it was injury. Now, if she said so, and the jury was misled by it, then the judge had a duty to say, the prosecutor said something, she was not correct, this is what it is. He should have done so unambiguously and clearly. But we cannot say today whether or not the 
prosecutor said that the risk was injury, although I contend that she said so, because we have a fragmentary and contradictory note made by the judge. That is what we have. That is what we went to the Court of Appeal with. Fragmentary and contradictory note, which the effect of which is that Mr. Fraser has to abandon the ground. He cannot rely on the ground because there is no way to establish that that is what happened. Suppose now that the appeal had been heard two years after he had been convicted. Yes, sir. That would be a fairly reasonable time, given the circumstances. What, what, what would make at uh, this point different now that it is ten years later, and not two years after? But if you consider, sir, that I saw the record of appeal for the first time on the 4th of October 2017, the day before the case was scheduled to be called. This conviction happened in November 2007. If I had seen the record in 2009, mm -hmm. I would have seen that inconsistency and there was something that could have been done about it. Some policeman, some member of the jury, some person who was not me or Mark Fraser, could have sworn an affidavit setting out in full detail this is what happened at the, the closing address. There was a newspaper article. It wasn't on that, on that issue, but it was on the display by the prosecutors. There was a newspaper article exhibited to the affidavit in support of the petition for bail. That, that newspaper article has not been produced in the record. So, just, just a minute. The In 2007, what was, the, what was regarded as the authentic record of what transpired in court? What the judge wrote in his hand in, in, in the book, in his book. So could you contradict that? Well, it would be, I suppose, a matter for whether the Court of Appeal would be willing to accept it, what weight they would want to put on the evidence which came forward. But if such evidence were put before the Court of Appeal, it would, it would have some sort of weight if a policeman employed at the court or a member of the jury said, this is actually what happened and the, the official record doesn't reflect that. Surely that would not be ignored, Your Honor. Surely somebody would say, well, perhaps this has some weight. The appellant is saying so. Some uninterested third party is saying so. Maybe this has some weight. Maybe it would have been taken into consideration. But the fact that 10 years later, this was seen for the first time, means that there was no recourse other than to abandon that round of appeal. There's nothing that anybody could do. Whether or not it would have had weight, perhaps it would. No, no, sorry. No you, one can say. Are, are you saying there was a discrepancy you're saying? Yes, sir. Between what the judge recorded? Yes, sir. And what, is it you? thought you heard in court? No, sorry, I didn't, I heard it. You heard it. Sorry. And then I, in, after I heard it, yes. I wrote a letter to the judge, which is part of the record. Yeah. I didn't object. Yeah. I wrote a letter to the, the judge's registrar, which is part of the record, and I went with authorities to show that the risk was not injury, but it was death. Good. So you, you, um, you are saying to my brother that if this issue had arisen two years after conviction. Yes, sir you could have made that point to the Court of Appeal. I could have produced evidence. So what show. prevents you from making that point 10 years after? I don't know where the policemen are, sorry. I don't know where the members of the jury are. They, and even if I could find them, they no, I thought, would I not thought, remember from 10 years ago what happened. I thought happened. the evidence was coming from you. Well, I would have to rely also on their memory that the same thing happened. I couldn't tell them what to say. So if they remembered, if it was a short time after, it is not unreasonable to, to have a transcript of what happened within a reasonable time. What a reasonable time is depends on the circumstances, but surely people should know, that should, they should see the record of the proceedings. You are saying if it was held a little earlier, within say two years, you yes, could sir. have got not just your own recollection, but that of other persons. Yes, sir. Maybe more than have... one person. Maybe it would have persuaded the court. But after 10 years happened, first of all, I can't find them. And second of all, even if I were able to find them, they wouldn't remember. They wouldn't remember something like the risk of, of death or the risk of injury. You, you, do you know of any instance where evidence taken from 
other members of the persons who were present in court was adduced in order to contradict the official note? I know of no such um, incidents. I, I believe that it, it has happened in Guyana where something happened that you would put an affidavit in the past. I have seen such reference in reports, uh, perhaps in the Yasin and Thomas case where the person did not give evidence in the high court. I believe that there was an affidavit from one of the lawyers in that case. But it may have been just to say what the circumstances were. But even if there is no Before precedent on, for it, sir. Can I ask a question on this particular point in the transcript from the Court of Appeal? Did they not identify specific areas in the judge's summina which they pointed to and concluded address this uh, issue, that is to say, whether it was a risk of injury or risk of death? And they identified those parts in the summoner and said that the trial judge properly directed the jury as to what the test was, about which before us you, have, you find no fault. In other words, you say that in the course of addresses, the uh, prosecutor misstated the standard. Yes? Yes, sir. You heard that five times. However, the Court of Appeal heard that argument. You raised that before them, and they, in the transcript of their uh, decision, identified, I think it was two specific parts of the summoner. And they say, in response to your argument, in fact, the summing up cannot be faulted because the jury was properly directed as to the standard by the trial judge. Yes? Is, that, is it correct that the Court of Appeal did that in their reasoning? That is correct, sir. You have not found fault in that part of the Court of Appeal's reasoning, i.e., that the Court of Appeal concluded that the summing up of the judge was accurate. Your criticism is the judge was not clear because the judge should have said the prosecutor was wrong. Yes, sir. Right. But what if the judge said what was right? Your Honor, the, the issue becomes complicated because this arises out of what is missing from the record, what is missing from the summing up and from the, the record of what happened before the judge. So I have looked at it from the, from the point of view of fairness to Mr. Fraser, that if this happened, as I said it did, then the judge should have gone further to make it clear that what the prosecutor said was not correct. If it is ambiguous as to what was said, and perhaps what the judge said was fine. But my issue with this is not that what the judge said is that it is missing from the record. Okay. And that because it is missing from the record, it cannot be relied upon and had it been there. With respect, Mr. Ramkarang, I have to um, object here. Um, it, it's The essence of what you're saying is that the Court of Appeal misdirected itself in regarding the judge's summing up as curing or being sufficient to cure whatever misstatement you see the prosecutor made. Sir, in fact, what I'm saying is that the Court of Appeal did not place enough emphasis on the fact that it was unfair to Mr. Fraser that this item was missing from the record. Well, with respect, uh, Mr. Rankaran, yes, the Court of Appeal dealt with part, precisely what you are saying was unfair. Yes, sir. Now, the degree of emphasis which they gave may not suit yes, your sir. desire, but they dealt with it. So I'm very curious as to how you can go any place further other than your arguing that the Court of Appeal erred in law in regarding what they said, what the judge said as curative. Yes, sir. But then the question is not what the prosecutor said. The question is what the court of, the, the high court judge did in his summing up. 
Certainly, sir. Yeah, well, then leave out what the prosecutor said. Certainly, sir. I, I will not belabor the point. The only issue I make But you see, this is exactly it. You are belaboring the point sir, because... I, no, I wait, apologize. No, hold on. Let me finish. What you are trying to do is to get us engaged with things which took place as a matter of evidence, things which took place in the course of the trial. But what we need to be concerned with is what did the judge do and what did the Court of Appeal do or say in relation to these issues, not to the absence of their being available to you, the evidence of what took place in the course of the trial. Certainly, sir. My, my only argument in this regard, sir, is that the length of time between the conviction and the appeal was inordinately long, in addition, in addition to suffering, because that length of time was inordinately long by itself, which by itself is a breach of the fundamental right to a fair hearing within a reasonable time. The length of time itself also added the difficulty because Mr. Fraser discovered that things were missing, omitted, or stated differently With in the record. With respect, Mr. Ramkaran, you are coming back to that, and I'm trying to tell you. No, sir, this is, this is the entire point, sir. No, I'm but, not coming back. But I'm saying to you that that point is one which I find difficulty in your repeating. Yes, sir. It is the entire point, but it is a point I find difficulty with. The question is not what is missing from the record. The question is what did the judge do which made what the judge did wrong. This is not the only issue that is complained of, Your Honor. This is one issue. Yeah. Another issue is a demonstration with the AK-47 by the two prosecutors. Mm -hmm. right. Be before you go there, just one small question. Um, you indicated that you had written to the judge? Yes, sir. Um, um, complaining. Uh, did, you, did you raise that point at the, in trial, at, you know, when the judge... Uh, when the error was made, what shall we say? It's not in the grounds of appeal, sir, because these, these issues arose after the grounds of appeal were filed in 2007. This, this complaint that I make is as a result of delay, which was raised as a pre preliminary point before the Court of Appeal orally. I understand. I'm asking a different question. I'm asking you whether you raised the point at trial. I, I raised it before the Court of Appeal, sir, before the hearing, in a letter written to the uh, registrar to the Chancellor, which is in the record, sir. Okay, thanks. Because you wouldn't know that it was not in the record before you saw it. Well, I saw the record on the 4th of October, uh, sir. And yeah, I, yeah, I, after I, 10 years. Yes, sir. But you could not object during the summing up because you wouldn't know what no, was in the record. At I put point. it as a ground of appeal. Yeah. And when I got to the appeal stage, I could no longer rely on it because it was but often, often the trial judge, I'm not sure if he did it in this case, asked counsel, well, is there anything else that I should say to the jury, or did I say something I shouldn't have said? Uh, and counsel, my understanding is, often has an opportunity to point out any area of concern. And that is what my question was getting at. Did you point out an area of concern to the judge at the relevant time? And I gather you're saying you did not. No, sir, I, I did not. But I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm a little unclear on something. You wrote the letter, didn't you? I wrote the letter judge. before his summing up, Yes, sir. I understand that. You wrote the letter before his summing up, but you wrote the letter to the judge yes, sir. saying that this was a misrepresentation of the law. Yes, sir. Right. You got the judge's summing up ten years later. Yes, sir. Right. Was your letter a part of the record? No, sir, it was not. Not part of the official record. Right. When you got the summon up ten years later, could you have included, because the matter, the actual hearing was adjourned, you got it four days before, but in fact it was not heard until a few months later, right? Yes, sir. Could, did you have an opportunity to include or to request the inclusion of your letter? I... In the, before the Court of Appeal, Your yes. Honor? Could you have, when you saw the record, made an application to say, I want the record amended to include a letter that I wrote? Because you put the letter before us, haven't you? Yes, yes. So sir. you had the letter. Yes, sir. You could have done I, that. I put it before the Court of Appeal as well, sir. Well, exactly. So 
What I am not following quite clearly is this. The argument is that you were prejudiced because you could not raise the fact that the prosecutor misrepresented the law. But you had a letter, a contemporaneous document yes, that sir. documented that. Yes, did sir. you? I did. And that was before the Court of Appeal. It was. Sir. So how did the 10-year delay prejudice raising the point when you produced a contemporaneous document that made the very point? Because, because sir, yeah. if it's not in the record, if it is not recorded by the judge, then it never happened. It's my word against his. So. I don't follow the prejudice, you see, because you raised it in the Court of Appeal, didn't you? Yeah, yes, and sir. And produced the letter. Yes, sir, I did. So you could have said the prejudice is it's not in the record. Yeah, I think in a similar question I asked you, you had responded to the effect that um, other persons um, may have witnessed the misrepresentation as well. Yes, sir. But with the passage of the years, you know, the recollection of those persons might have faded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I thought I could be wrong, but I thought that was the response you had given to the question I'd asked yes, sir. along the same lines. Okay. So I think you're moving on. I, I, I interrupted you. Sorry, you're moving on to something else. Yes, so sir. Answer. So, yes, the demonstration of the weapon. By the demonstration of the weapon by the prosecutors. There is no description in the judge's notes of what the prosecutors did with the weapon. And it, it was a ground of appeal that the demonstration was inappropriate, that prosecutors have a duty to be fair. And if one person, if two people knew what happened, one of those persons is dead, the other person has given uh, an account of what happened, and that account is different from the demonstration that you're doing, then your demonstration is unfair. Now, if there is no record of... Sorry, was an objection taken to the unfair demonstration when it had taken place? No, sir, I don't believe that there was. Yes, but then what do you expect the judge to do? Okay. The, On the substance of this matter, Mr. Ramkaran, The man's caution <laughs> statement by itself, was that disputed by him? Yes, sir, it was. It was disputed and there was a war there. The judge accepted it without giving reasons for accepting it? No, no, no. The, 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 the war there was to determine its voluntariness. Yes, sir. But its content. In his address from the dock, the statement that he gave contradicted the statement. And it said, he said that I never said that I heard it, um, I heard the gun um, cranked or that I pointed, I never pointed it at the fellow. So he said those things. Yeah, but then that then became a matter of fact for the jury. Yes, sir. So where are we going with that issue? Well, well Your Honors, there are a number of different issues which establish that there is a miscarriage of justice. One is delay. Two is what happened in the summing up. A large, a large one is that the judge never gave the elements of the offense of gross negligence manslaughter in a way that the jury could understand. So if... Uh, that is a point separate from the delay. Yes, sir, but... That, can, that, that point Honor, can be looked at one year later, 10 years later, yes, 20 years later. This is separate and apart from delay. Yes. On the issue of delay, sir, I have only three arguments, well, three incidents in which the delay affected the trial. The first is the length of time, and then I have the, the, what the prosecutor said. I have the demonstration between the prosecutors with the weapon, and I have the fact that the, there was no jury investigation and that nothing can be done about it. Well, the judge said that we consented to the 
jury going on, mm -hmm. although I was the one who complained that a juror was seen speaking with a relative of the deceased. The note that is recorded is that everybody consented to the trial going on with the juror. This did not in fact happen. I did not know that that was what the judge wrote until 10 years later. Now, I said it to the Court of Appeal in my submissions that I did not consent. Mr. Fraser was never asked for his consent. He did not consent. But well, the Court of Appeal heard you on that. They heard. Yeah. They heard. I, I'm not sure whether they gave a, a rule. I don't believe that they gave a specific ruling on that issue on, in itself. But, but again, it, let's say the appeal had been heard two years later. Yes, sir. Uh, you have to give me an idea of what the difference is because the, the, two years later you make this point. Um, what could you have done that you couldn't do ten years later? I could have tried to find the foreman of the jury and the police Mr. who was present. Mr. Mr. Rankaran, this is the second time you are drawing our attention to the absence of access to, as it were, corroborating witnesses. But the essence in both instances is your statement that what yes, the judge has in his summing up, in his record, is wrong. Yes, sir. So you are contradicting the judge. Yes, so sir. do you know what, what that does? It puts you as the witness. Yes, sir. So if it is your contention that the judge misstated or misrecorded what occurred, then you have to be the witness. So you get another counsel and you become a witness. Yes, sir. That was open to you 10 years yes. after, 15 years after. I'm not sure, sir, if I can get another lawyer to volunteer to do this case, so that is not an option which is open to me. No, with the greatest of respect, with yes, the greatest of respect. Um, that is not something that we can just hear you say off the top and accept. Yeah? I think, I'm sir. Saying, I'm saying to you that if these were sufficiently important, these are things that you could be a witness to. It, it was open. I considered it. I did not know how appropriate it was for me as the person who had put these things down on the grounds of appeal to then swear an affidavit that so and so happened. I concluded that it was not appropriate as the lawyer doing the case for me to do it, and I would have liked to no, get I, I, somebody I entire, who was... I entirely agree that yes, you sir. cannot be counsel as well as a witness to a fact. So you would have had to cease being counsel? Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I considered that. Right. And, and in considering it, I concluded that even if I were no longer counsel in the matter, if I were to swear such an affidavit, it would not be proper because I was the lawyer in the case. And that, that would not be proper. So and it, I, I it, thought would been, it would have been proper for the juror to have sworn it, but uh, not for you? A person who was disinterested, a third party was disinterested to say, this is what I recall happening. I thought that that would have been more appropriate. I, see. I did say it in the submissions that this is what happened. I said so. Yeah, but that's of, of no weight. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt that that was all I could do in the circumstances. Okay. Or if a policeman said I was present and I did not hear anybody consent, I felt that that, that was something that could have happened. Okay. So those were the three instances, Your Honors, that the delay affected the, the appellant's case. Mr. Fraser's case in my submission. And okay, but you, you, you have to go <coughs> further because the, the Court of Appeal accepted the point about delay. Yes, sir. And they did give you a remedy. They did, sir. So where do you go from there? It is my contention that in addition to delay, sir, there were many other grounds of appeal the on the substance? On the substance. So is it that you are content with the recognition of your right to trial within a reasonable time having been breached and to the remedy which you were afforded by the Court of Appeal? No, sir. That is not so. I, it is my submission that the Court of Appeal should have gone further in the circumstances. Ah, the remedy if, was not sufficient. Yes, sir. If it is that somebody is prevented from prosecuting grounds of appeal. And despite the court's views, I am sure that the court will agree with me that there is some, some restriction, at the very least, 
of the ability to prosecute the grounds of appeal which could not be prosecuted because of the delay. And if it is that somebody has been restricted from prosecuting his grounds of appeal in the interest of fairness and in the interest of ensuring that that person has a fair trial and is allowed the protection of the law, the Court of Appeal should have gone further and quashed the conviction because those facts would have led to a miscarriage of justice which rendered the conviction unsafe. Just simply the delay and its effect. The breach of the fundamental right to a fair hearing within a reasonable time would have meant that Mr. Fraser should have had his conviction quashed. But that is separate and apart from the other issues of miscarriage of justice arising out of the substantive issues at trial. Yeah, on, the point, on, on the point you just mentioned, you're actually saying, well, I could have, if it had been within a reasonable time that the appeal was heard, I could have brought fresh evidence to show what, what really happened, and that would have uh, made the conviction unsafe. Yes, sir, but there, there are two complaints, really. One, that it is missing, and it should not be missing, or it is stated differently, it should not be stated differently. And two, although it is stated differently, even though this is not what should happen, I possibly could have corrected that, but the length of time which elapsed made it impossible for it to be corrected. Mm -hmm. So that is my complaint, sir. Okay. So that yes, is the delay point. That is the delay issue, sir. You also have other grounds of appeal which yes, sir. you think make the conviction unsafe. Yes, Separate sir. and apart from the delay. Separate and apart from the delay. It is my submission that the Court of Appeal did not sufficiently consider and apply the principles of law to the numerous grounds of appeal which were raised before it in order to determine either separately or cumulatively the conviction was unsafe. What are your three most strongest points? The first strongest point is that the, the elements of gross negligence manslaughter were not sufficiently put to the jury with the facts which could establish those elements. The judge used terms of art like recklessness, negligence, and so on without explaining to the jury precisely how negligence arose on the facts. What did Mark Fraser do? What sort of duty did he have? What did he do to breach that duty? If someone is passing a weapon to you, first, what is the evidence to show what should be done? And second, what did he do to, to breach this, this uh, duty of care towards Mr. Rollins. Tell me something, was there any evidence that this gun discharged itself, malfunctioned? No, sir. So his hand was on the trigger? Well, he says, sir, that the, he did not have the, the barrel, the magazine in the gun. When he left it on the bed, there was no magazine in the gun, and the place was dark. And when it was handed back to him, it was much heavier because it had a magazine on it, and it, it slipped. And that was consistent with where it, the, the, the angle it was at on his leg when, when it went off. But, but, <coughs> Mr. Ramkran, if you fr conceded, quite frankly, well, the ballistics probably determined that as well. The gun went off because somebody squeezed the trigger. Yes, sir. No, he is a soldier. Yes, sir. So he really ought to have known that you don't put your finger on the trigger. Well, certainly, sir, but although there is no evidence of what his training was and, <laughs> and why he was a 19-year-old boy, he was a soldier, yes, but also a 19-year-old boy, there were, in certain circumstances, where they were trying to get out in a dangerous situation, a dangerous time, and somebody picked up his weapon. So it's not just simply 
I'm a soldier, I have training, I know what to do. The man handed him the weapon. So but does, he, does said, he concede that he's the one who pulled the trigger? Well, so I, I don't think I ever saw in any evidence he said, I pulled the trigger. So the answer is yes. Yeah. So he concedes that he pulled the trigger. Well, the trigger went off as a result of... <laughs> of that just doesn't happen yeah. just like that, then. Eh? Yes, sir. Uh, and every soldier, everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. is the first thing you learn, how to handle a gun. Don't put your finger on a trigger, Perfect. and always... Uh, never point with a gun at but someone, not even yourself. He was collecting the gun, sir. So he wasn't pointing it. He was collecting it. It was being handed to him. So there are all of those factors. To That's be what he said from the dock, wasn't it? That's what he said also in the statement, I think, that it was being handed to him. I'm not sure his statement was... In the statement, I think he said it was pointed. You know. He pointed it at... He, he has complaints about that statement. If he had pointed it, sir, the bullet would not have gone into the roof if he had pointed it to the fellow. In his caution statement, he said, I, I, um, I then said, give me my weapon. I collected the weapon and pointed at him. While I was about to put it on the bed, I pulled the trigger and the gun went off. That yes, is what his statement is. Yes. And of course, there were witnesses saying that he... He had it at a 45 degree angle. Yeah. On his, on his yeah. leg. Okay, so you say, anyhow, that the, the, the judge did not sufficiently explain to the jury the threshold for gross negligence or yes, what exactly is meant by the legal terms of negligence and recklessness. Yes, what else? He also did not, after one would have expected him to set out precisely what the facts were and the elements of the offense, he also did not explain to the jury that the state had to negative accident beyond a reasonable doubt. Use the words accident if you believe it is an accident, but you're not going far enough to say that this, it was the duty of the state to negative beyond reasonable doubt that this was an accident. The judge erred in law in my submission. Three. Pardon me, Ron? I think Justice Witt asks for the top three, so you have two so far. There is the evidence of the ballistics expert, sir. In Yasin and Thomas, it was held that where a person does not give evidence in the magistrate's court, there should be good reason for them giving evidence in the high court, because the only thing that an accused has is a deposition to know what case is made out against him. Now, the state said, in, in answer to, to those submissions, that you had the ballistics reports. Well, the ballistics reports were tendered, I believe, by somebody else. They didn't say anything. They just said the size of the shell and so on. They didn't say what the ballistics expert came and said. So there was a voir dire, and at the end of that voir dire, it was inconclusive whether the ballistics expert gave evidence or not in the high court. No, I don't understand. There was a voir dire, sir. Mm -hmm. To determine what? To determine whether or not the ballistics expert gave evidence in the magistrate's court. There were two witnesses led in that voir dire. Because the state said, yes, he did, but the evidence was not in the deposition. So there were two witnesses led. One, one, said, he, one said he was there, he gave evidence in the magistrate's court, and the other said no. Yes, sir. So the, no, but to clarify, did the other say no, or did the, uh, did the clerk say, I do not recall? She My said she, she did not recall, but she got all of the evidence up, typed it up, and compiled it into the, the deposition. Enough. But I'm just saying to be accurate, I think what she yes. said in what I read was that I don't recall whether uh, this evidence was or was not given, but describe what was done. Yes, yes? Sir. No one was ever able to produce any notes, any typed written evidence or anything from the ballistics expert. So the only evidence that he did give evidence in the magistrate's court were the words taken and a date on a file of the prosecutor. So that's the only evidence that he, he gave evidence in the magistrate's court. There's nothing else to suggest that he did. In Yasin and Thomas, when a witness gave evidence who did not give evidence in the magistrate's court and where no explanation was given 
for his absence, the conviction was quashed. So, in this case, it could not be concluded that the ballistics expert gave evidence in the magistrate's court. But that is one issue. But he gave evidence at the trial. He gave evidence in the magistrate's court. But he came and gave evidence at trial without giving a reason why he did not. Did you have any statement from him beforehand, before he no, gave sir. evidence at the trial? As far as I recall, no, sir. The ballistics reports were there. But the expert evidence that he gave, I did not have a statement. Yeah, but did he go outside of the report? Well, one of the things he said, sir, was that uh, AK-47 trigger could not be pulled by accident. So, well, I think what he said was it takes five, the equivalent of five pounds of effort yes, sir. to uh, discharge the AK-47. Yes, sir. And that in his opinion, that could not have been done accidentally. Yes, sir. But I think his technical evidence was that it took five pounds of pressure. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Was that in the ballistics report? Because that was a critical, that, that piece of evidence is the evidence which you were very concerned about. That, yes, sir. Right. Was that piece of evidence in the ballistics report? That is to say, it would take five pounds of pressure to discharge the AK-47. The ballistics report, sir, the answer is no. The ballistics report says only that this is the type of weapon and this is the type of shell. It doesn't have anything about any sort of opinion on what sort of pressure it takes and what but sort of... You would have it. received that evidence for the first time, Viva Voce, when yes, sir. the expert gave it. Right? Yes, sir. My complaint about this evidence is that the judge did not unambiguously tell the jury that the expert was not an expert in accidents. He might have been an expert in guns, but he could not say what was or was not an accident, what could happen accidentally. And whether, he, whether all AK-47s take five pounds of pressure to pull, it, pull the trigger, or whether this AK-47 takes five pounds of pressure, that was not ascertained. Whether he tested that AK-47 and determined precisely what, what sort of pressure it would take to pull the trigger. Wouldn't these be questions in cross-examination? Indeed, sir, they could have been questions in cross-examination. And they were but, not, sorry, they were not asked in cross-examination? Well, he said unambiguously that the AK-47 took five pounds of pressure to pull the trigger. What um, my complaint is, sir? No, no. Your complaint, no, is that there was not any evidence whether this particular AK yes, needed sir. five pounds, but that is purely an issue raised by you yes, now. The question is, was it raised at the trial? It was raised in the address before the jury. It was not raised in cross-examination. Then, Mr. Ramkaran, you can't get anywhere with that, can you? That, that is only an issue I raise here in passing, sir. The, the issue I have, Correct. sir. You're raising this in passing as one of your three strongest points? No, sir. The okay. issue that I'm raising here, with, of which this forms part, is the fact that the judge did not say in no uncertain terms that this was an opinion of the ballistics expert, the issue of accident, what was and was not an accident, or what could or could not be an accident, was merely an opinion of the ballistics expert, which was not based on his expertise. That was not based on his expertise, sir. You, you, you have me lost there, but I will still lost. Continue. <laughs> so, in my submission, Your Honors, the judge should have said that although this person is an expert in ballistics, his expertise does not extend to the area of accidents because anything can happen accidentally. The fact that it takes five pounds of pressure to pull the trigger of an AK-47 does not mean that one could not pull it accidentally in the circumstances in which the incident upon which Mr. Fraser was charged happened. Did the, you say specifically, that is the ballistic expert, that it could not have been discharged by accident? Did he say that? I, I that's, that's what I was trying to clarify. My recollection is what he said positively was that it required five pounds of pressure. There's a difference between saying that which an expert can say yes, sir. and be tested or not on it. And what you are suggesting is that he is not an expert on accidents. Yes, sir. 
earlier you said, he said that it could only have been discharged by an accident, but those two things can come together only if he did say that it could only have been discharged by an accident. By accident. Did he say that? As far as I recall, sir, he did say that. Okay, yeah. And I would have set out exactly where he said so in my submissions, Your Honor, in the High Court, in the Court of Appeal. So in my submission, Your Honor... But I suppose you would have said that in the High Court, too. I may have said so. I, it's, it's a very long time ago, sir. I, I can't uh, recall if I said so in the closing address or not. I, I probably said so. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you didn't ask for an adjournment after he gave evidence. You didn't ask the court for an adjournment, for example, to... For? Well, you could have another, uh, your own expert. Uh, as far as I know, sir, that gentleman is the only ballistics expert in Guyana. I, in Guyana? I, I don't know of any other. That, that would and be I did not at the time know of any other person I could have okay. called to contradict okay, him. So those, were, those are the three strongest points. No, sir, those, I, I think two points. You have two other strong points. As, as far as I'm concerned, sir, yeah, all of, of my course, points of are course, strong. Of course, of course. Degrees of, of strength between them. <laughs> yes. Your Honor, there was no investigation of the jury by the judge. The judge should have gone further than calling the foreman, the policeman, the relative, the counsel for the accused in his chambers. You mean in relation to the voir dire as to whether or not the juror was spoken to by a relative? Yes, sir. Is your Honor? Yes, sir. In relation to whether that juror spoke to other members of the jury. So your criticism is that the process of the, the, the voir dire itself was faulty then well, because the investigation was not uh, extensive enough. Is that, is that what you're saying? In my submission, sir, to call it a voir dire would be going too far. The judge called us in chambers. At the same time I made the complaint, we went into chambers and he said, everybody please cooperate with the lawyers. Okay, and we went back out and continued the trial. So this is what this is what happened, sir. There was no investigation of any sort. There is a brief note in the judge's notebook of what happened, where he says that it was consented to. But in my submission, he should have gone further to investigate what it was, whether this person said anything to anybody, and to determine whether or not there was any possibility of bias, and if so, to discharge the juror. None of this happened. Sorry, did you protest? When you came out of chambers and you made that statement, did well, you say, did you say that, Judge, this is not sufficient with respect, and I demand a mistrial or anything of the sort? No, sir, I did not do that. I, I made my complaint, and the judge did what he felt was, was enough. I, I which, which was to say, we will go on. Yes, sir. Right, and then it was open to you to say, hold on. I made a complaint. You have now determined that this is the way you're going. I will now take an objection to this case proceeding any further. Well, at that time, sir, I was a young and enthusiastic man, and I felt that when judges made these sorts of mistakes, the recourse was to appeal, not to fight the judge down and say, you did it your way, but I want you to do no it my way. Well, benefited from delay. I, well, <laughs> Not really, sir. I, I did put it as a ground of appeal that, that there was no sufficient investigation. But that is what at the time I felt was appropriate. If a judge makes a mistake, you appeal. Yeah, but you see, the thing is this. It's a matter of opinion. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I know, sir, in your personality, you may have done some things differently, but I, I was quiet and mild, and if a judge made a mistake, I felt that the recourse is appeal. If I drew an issue to the judge's attention, and he doesn't do what I want him to do, I felt that Recourses to appeal. Okay. Your Honor, the, the judge did not tell the jury that they, they could disagree. When they came up the second when they came up for further directions on gross negligence manslaughter. It is my submission that the judge was required to tell the jury that if you cannot reach an agreement and it is not sufficient for a 
majority decision that you can disagree. At that point, the, judge, the jury having, having gone in at 1 o'clock and having come out back at 4 o'clock, it would have been appropriate, or, or 3, it would have been appropriate to say to the jury, reaching an, agree an agreement is very good, but if at the end of all of your discussions you cannot reach an agreement, it is, you, you are permitted to disagree. At no point in time did the judge tell that to the jury. In my submission, Your Honor. Just to be clear, what is the impact of their disagreeing? The case will, will have to, there will be no verdict if they disagree. The case no. will have to be reheard. And you, you say that they had retired for how long? Three hours? Two hours? They were in the jury room from 1 to 6. They returned with the verdict at 6 p.m. Approximately, sir. The record says exactly what the times were, but approximately so between were, 1 and 6. To be clear, so about five hours? About five hours, sir. And you're saying that's too long. You should have told them before that. Well, they, they came out on. around three or four, sir. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, you should have said, if it is not possible to agree, we now, may you, see, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to follow. Um, you said three or four, but there's a significant difference between the two. So if they came out at 3 o'clock, they went in at 1, they came out at 3, yes, they sir. spent two hours in the jury room. You're saying at that point, the judge should tell them, look, if you can't agree, you disagree, and we start everything over again after two hours. Yes, sir. Okay. It, the time is exactly stated, sir. I believe it is 3 o'clock or not. Okay. But, Your Honor, I follow precedent when I make this submission to say that at the appropriate time, it is the duty of the judge to let the jury know that it is possible for them to disagree. Because when a jury has been in the jury room from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., if they don't reach agreement, some people might feel pressurized to go along with the others in order to finish the case and get home. Five hours is a long time for a jury to be sequestered in a jury room. And it is my submission that if not at that point in time, at some later point in time, the judge should have said that... Later, but not later than five hours. Well, it, it was... The exact timing is set out in the record, so the exact precise time as recorded. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not myself a, you know, a practitioner in criminal law, but um, I'm not sure I find five hours to be exorbitant. Personally speaking, um, I, I seem to think that juries have uh, deliberated for much longer than five hours. Certainly, uh, sir, but they should know. But it, however long they want to deliberate is fine. Yes. That is not the problem. They should be aware that if you cannot reach an agreement, it is okay to disagree. Okay. They can deliberate for, for as long as they want once they know that. And it was the duty of the judge to tell them that fact. Mm -hmm. Having not told them, Your Honor, it is possible that some somebody in the jury or one or more people felt pressured to go along with the majority and come back with a verdict. They were not aware that they could have disagreed. Mm -hmm. Your Honors, there is a mushtaq direction which was not given to the jury in relation to the statement. The facts in relation to the voluntary statement given by Mark Fraser are set out at length in the submissions before the Court of Appeal. It is my submission that that statement was taken on the oppressive conditions and that the judge, although he accepted it, first of all, he ought to have found it inadmissible, and if not inadmissible, unfair. And even if he did not find it inadmissible or unfair, he should have told the jury, if you believe that there are circumstances which were oppressive in the taking of this statement, you should disregard it. Mr. Ankaran? Yes, sir. Wasn't this submission made to the Court of Appeal? Yes, sir. So then why are you making it to us? Well, I am making it to you, sir, because the Court of Appeal did not agree. And in contesting the... Then this, this is exactly the point. The submission you need to make to us is where the Court of Appeal went wrong. Well, on all of these issues, Your Honor, on all of these issues that they have raised, the Court of Appeal disagreed. 
Yes, but that, that's the point. So look at what um, is troubling me. The Court of Appeal disagrees on all of these things. Yes, so sir. what do you – disagrees with your submission. Yes, sir. So what do you do? You say, hold on, okay. I want to argue um, in relation to what the judge did. Forget what the Court of Appeal decided. Yes, sir. I want to argue this afresh before the CCJ. You can't do that. You have to argue to us what the Court of Appeal did. Well, Your Honor, forgive me for so doing. There is a transcript of the judgment of the Court of Appeal in which it's not very detailed as to the reasons for the Court of Appeal's decision. Okay. And in addition, not every issue of complaint was dealt with in the decision of the Court of, in the judgment of the Court of Appeal. Okay. So I have perhaps not dealt with the issue properly, but what I have tried to do before, Your Honors, is to say that these grounds, these grounds of appeal, which were before the Court of Appeal, but which were not accepted by the Court of Appeal, were strong enough on their own in order for at least one of them to be sufficient to be found to be a miscarriage of justice in order to allow me to bring an appeal to the Caribbean Court of Justice where it can be properly, properly considered. My case here, Your Honor, is not the substantive appeal. I am not prepared to argue the substantive appeal here today. I merely want to show, Your Honors, that there are numerous grounds from delay to procedural irregularities to substantive errors in law to say to Your Honors that surely this conviction was not fair. Surely this conviction is not safe. Surely Mark Fraser did not have a fair trial in the High Court on account of all of these cumulative errors of law. Simply to say that uh, important points of law are raised, such as the elements of gross negligence, manslaughter, so, so as to direct judges. The issue is highly complicated, Your Honors. There have been numerous decisions of the Court of Appeal, R.V. Rose, R.V. Cuddas, Adamako from the House of Lords. The issue is not a simple issue. As far as I'm aware, there are no serious cases in the Commonwealth Caribbean dealing with this issue. So there is at least one substantial point of law to be addressed. In addition, there are numerous miscarriages of justice in my submissions. In addition, there is in my submission a serious case to be tried. There is also the issue of whether your honors would want to exercise your discretion to find that the Court of Appeal made an error in concluding that this matter did not fall under Section 6B, I believe it is, of the Caribbean Court of Justice Act, that there was a genuinely disputable question as to redress. Yeah, but as I said at the outset, right? can we go back there now? I mean, even if they made an error on that point, um, it doesn't mean that you, this is a special leave application. Yes, well, as I said, I, I base this not on precise authority saying that it can be done, but only on authority which says it is developed on a case-by-case -case basis and the discussion that came out in LOP number one. Your Honours, in my submission, the court cannot arrive at the answer yes to the question whether Mr. Fraser has been afforded the procedural and substantive safeguards required by the rule of law, which amount to the protection of law. I believe, Your Honours, that there are numerous issues of legal points of public importance. I believe that it should be clear to Your Honours that Mr. Fraser suffered a miscarriage of justice in the upholding of the conviction. I believe that Your Honours can, if he is allowed to appeal, fashion the appropriate remedy for these breaches and that it will lead to the setting aside of the conviction. Your Honours, many people believe that if the imprisonment, the period of imprisonment is stayed, then he has won. This is not so, Your Honours. He will bear with him the rest of his life, if Your Honours do not change the situation, the conviction of manslaughter, which is second most serious offense next to murder. He will have that for the rest of his life. It carries stigma if employers know you're convicted of manslaughter, even in a situation like that, which in my submission would have been an accident. 
you can be fired, your children will know you killed somebody, you've been convicted of manslaughter. It's a very serious thing. The staying of imprisonment does not fix the situation, Your Honours. And I would urge Your Honours to look afresh at the material which was before the Court of Appeal, look afresh at the notes of evidence and at the summing up, and to give Mr. Fraser a chance to bring his appeal before Your Honours so that Your Honours can decide properly whether or not his conviction should be quashed. Unless, Your Honours, I can assist you with anything further, those would be my submissions. There was some dispute about whether he was a poor person. Yes, sir. But, but that's not some... really relevant in a criminal appeal, is it? Well, I think it, it uh, prevents him from paying filing fees. I'm, I'm not no, sure. According to the rules of court, you don't pay filing fees. A, in in the criminal criminal appeal. I'm, I'm not sure, sir. No. So I think that discussion is... He is a poor person, though, sir. He doesn't have wherewithal, whether or not it is relevant. Okay. Yes. Very grateful, sir. Thank you, Mr. Amkran. This is Ali Haq. May it please your honors, this application for special leave is in relation to a decision by the Court of Appeal of Ghana to dismiss an appeal by Mark Fraser and to uphold his conviction for the criminal offense of manslaughter. Your honors, he was convicted on the 14th of November 2007 and his, after his conviction, the Court of Appeal ordered a probation report. He was, two weeks after, upon the receipt of the probation report, they sentenced him, that's the High Court, to four years imprisonment. Ten years after his date of conviction, a notice of appeal was sent by the Court of Appeal. And the appeal was heard some months thereafter due to counsel not being prepared on the first occasion. He had come to the court of, to the CCJ here for leave to appeal um, a decision given by the court of appeal. The court of appeal recognized the 10 years delay from, his, from the applicant's date of conviction to the date of the hearing of the appeal. And they stayed his sentence, but they dismissed the appeal against the conviction. The Court of Appeal, in granting him that redress, followed the CCJ decisions of Suraj Singh against Saichan Harichan and Vishnu Bajwal against Harlat Hari Prashad. Special leave is now being sought from this court from a decision in a criminal matter. Since this application is in relation to a criminal appeal from a criminal charge for the offense of manslaughter, this is a criminal proceeding and the criminal standard applies, please, Your Honors. You mean to the grant of special leave? Yes, please, Your Honors. So what the, is, what, how would you explain that standard? You say the criminal standard applies to the grant of special leave. Yes, please, how Your Honors. How would Honor. you articulate that standard? That there is, uh, the applicant has to pro prove that there was a serious miscarriage of justice, as was the term used in some of the CCG decisions, or that there was a potential miscarriage of justice. Mm. 
So that, that's the test. Yes, please, Your Honours. What's the standard? That's the test. But you see, you said the criminal, when you said, so when you say the criminal standard applies, you mean, you mean the test in criminal proceedings applies? Yes, please, Your Honours. What, what is the standard? And the reason why I'm submitting this, please, Your Honours, is so, because... No, no, no I, I, I understand that. But is it, it, do you agree that the standard is arguability? Pardon me? Do you agree that the standard is arguability? In other words, yes, what, please. Yeah, or, it has okay. to be an arguable or a deserving case. Okay. Mm. An applicant would have to prove that there was a miscarriage of justice. He will have to prove to this honorable court that he has an arguable case that there was a miscarriage of justice. Your Honours, the reason why I have mentioned this is because in his written submissions, Mr. Ramkaran has asked this court to find that the standard applicable for this application is that of a civil case. The reason being, the main, his main contention is the 10 years delay which is a breach of the applicant's constitutional right of fair hearing within a reasonable time. A, a breach which the Court of Appeal recognized, accepted, and granted redress, therefore. Your Honours, it is not unusual in a criminal proceeding to have a constitutional point. And this has happened in the cases, the CCJ cases of Nervis and Severin against the Queen, as well as Vishnu Bajlal and Hardat Hari Prashad. And in Hari Prashad's case, it was a similar situation where there was a delay a number of years between the time of conviction and the hearing of the appeal before this honorable court. In these circumstances, Your Honor, I respectfully submit that these proceedings are criminal, but they involve a constitutional point, as is not unusual in many criminal proceedings before this honorable court. I therefore ask Your Honors not to concede to counsel's request to lower the standard to that applicable to civil cases, as this is undoubtedly a criminal proceeding, and the standard required in this application is for the applicant to establish that there is a realistic possibility of a miscarriage of justice if leave is not given for a full hearing, or they have raised a point of law of public importance which, if not overturned, a questionable precedent might remain on the record. Your Honours, this brings me now... Where do, do you get that last formulation from? Your Honours, I got them a from... A point of law of public importance... Yes, please. ...is not overturned. It's... Uh, I got it from... In my written submissions, I have quoted it. I, I quoted from several of the CCJ decisions. That particular one is found in um, Justice Nelson. He summed, it, he summed it up very nicely. But that, that, that is not what he said. That's the point. No? You have it before you? Yes, please, Your Honours. Your Honours, I'm looking for the paragraph in my written submissions okay. to bring to your attention. I think from J.P. Doyle? Yes, I think so, please, Your Honours. Against the Queen. Against the Queen. So, in Pinder, at paragraph 3, citing mm -hmm. from Doyle, Justice Nelson said, generally this court will only intervene in criminal cases in circumstances 
where a serious miscarriage of justice may have occurred in the court below, or where a point of law of public importance is raised, and the applicant persuades the court that if it is not overturned, a questionable precedent might remain on the record. In such a case, the grant of leave to appeal is not necessarily an indication that the court agrees with the point, but only that the point is arguable. Yeah? Yes, please, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, please. That's where you got it from? Yes, please. Okay. Your Honor, this brings me to the grounds as submitted by counsel for the applicant. There are, in his application, seven grounds stated. Grounds one and two deal with the refusal of the Court of Appeal to grant leave to appeal to this honorable court as of right. The applicant states that an application was made to the Court of Appeal for leave to appeal. This application was made under Section 6D of the CCJ Act. Applications are made under 6D of the CCJ Act where there is an issue of the interpretation of the Constitution, which does not exist in this case. The constitutional issue which, is, which arises here, that's the applicant's breach of Article 1441 of the Ghana Constitution, that is his right of fair hearing within a reasonable time, deals with the application of the constitutional provision and not the interpretation of the constitutional provision. This was discussed by this honorable court by Mr. Justice de la Bastide in the case of the Queen against O'Neill Lewis. This case, therefore, it is my respectful submission, falls under Section 8 of the CCJ Act and not Section 6. The Court of Appeals' refusal to grant leave is not a ground. The Court of Appeals' refusal to grant leave pursuant to Section 6D in itself is not a ground for this application to this honorable court. This was mentioned by this honorable court in the cases of Barbados Surf Club against Eugene Melnick, James Anthony Hiles and the DP, and Mark Rodian Williams and the DP. Special leave to, to appeal is a matter of discretion of this honorable court where there is an arguable case and not a matter of right. The applicant must satisfy this court that there was a serious miscarriage of justice which may have occurred or may be occurring in the court below, or where there is a realistic possibility of a miscarriage of justice, or as I said before, a point of law of public importance is raised and the applicant persuades this honorable court that if it is not overturned, question and precedent might remain on the record. Sorry, Madam Director. I looked further at PINDA, and my engagement with your formulation had to do with how Mr. Ram Karan put it in his, and I see where he got it from, which was from the following paragraph in PINDA, where Justice Nelson summarized it, that the applicant must therefore persuade this court that a potential miscarriage of justice or a genuinely disputable point of law arises out of the decision appealed from in order to qualify. So he summarized it a genuinely disputable point of law and not simply a point of law of general public importance. Yes, please, Your Honor. Thank you. Sorry to have... The application to the Court of Appeal and its refusal therefore has no bearing on this application. And this was submitted in detail in our written submissions at paragraphs 15 to 30.
My respectful submission is that the Court of Appeals' refusal is not a realistic possibility, does not give rise to a realistic possibility of a miscarriage of justice, nor is it a point of genuine public importance, a genuine point of law, a genuine point of law of public importance, which has been raised by the applicant, and if it is not overturned, a questionable precedent might remain on the record. So that's in relation to grounds one and grounds two. Ground one and ground two. So that brings me now to ground three. Ground three states that the Court of Appeal refused to adjudicate in a preliminary manner on the issue of the breach of the applicant's fundamental right to fair hearing within a reasonable time guaranteed by Article 1441 of the Constitution. The applicant is arguing that the Court of Appeal should have heard the breaches, the breach of the applicant's constitutional right to fair hearing within a reasonable time as a preliminary point. This was up the applicant's contention in his ground and in his submissions. The Court of Appeal, when the application was made, informed counsel, first of all, granted time to counsel to submit, to make submissions, written submissions on the point, because it was not one of his original grounds of appeal. And having granted him time to make the submissions, the state was also granted time to respond. And then, and the court will be ruled that we will hear the constitutional point together with the other points. And the court of appeal did do that. And in doing that, the court of appeal recognized the importance of the breach of Article 1441 and granted redress, therefore. The Court of Appeal did not only hear that point. Director, I, I take it from what you said earlier that the Court of Appeal was then applying um, Article 141 rather than interpreting it. Yes, please, Your Honor. Okay, I want to make sure I understand you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All submissions made, made your honors, by the applicant were heard, including his arguments in relation to the effects of the delay. The applicant has not submitted any evidence of the possible contravention of his fundamental rights arising from delay or any other constitutional point which he wished the Court of Appeal to hear and they did not hear. I have to apologize Con that my, my brother earlier. Just to take you back one second. So, if, um, if it was an issue of the interpretation of 141, would that then make it into a constitutional stroke civil case? Your Honours, I did mention it in my written submissions that he yes. could have gone to the High Court, which has original jurisdiction for Articles 138 to 151 yes. under Article 153. Yes. And um, he could have gotten the, because one of the arguments he submitted is that he was not the Court of Appeal in hearing the constitutional point together with the other grounds, which he termed pure criminal law issues, mm -hmm. did not explore the constitutional issue as deeply and as well as they ought to have. But there's no evidence on the record of him having had points or submissions or grounds in relation to that constitutional issue, which he submitted to the Court of Appeal, and they did not consider. As a matter of fact, everything that was submitted to the Court of Appeal, they did consider. And they conceded that And they conceded. Yeah. And they granted redress. He's saying that the redress isn't sufficient. <clears throat> He's moving now to the conviction. And in relation to that, I'm going to refer 
to the Honorable Justice Witt, <laughs> sitting in the case of Gibson. Gibson. And um, he's, his Honor, Justice Witt, in that case said, given the high level of public interest in the determination of very serious crimes, however, it will only be in very exceptional circumstances that the person accused of such a crime will be able to obtain the remedy of a permanent stay or dismissal for the breach only of the reasonable time guarantee. And it's that point which we have to consider here because in Gibson's case, this was a case of murder. This is a case of manslaughter where there is loss of life. And it is, it does attract public interest. It's a very serious crime. Counsel for the applicant himself conceded a while ago that it's second after murder. I think he forgot reason. So in those circumstances, there will be, there will have, the, the applicant will have to show the court that the, there are exceptional circumstances that, the, that his client will be able to, up, in order for him to be able to obtain the remedy of a permanent stay. It's my respectful submission that there are no exceptional circumstances in this case. And I will go into the other grounds in, in establishing, in supporting this contention. The Court of Appeal, after hearing counsel on all other breaches, concluded that a conviction was safe. Thus, there was no exceptional circumstance in this case which could have entitled the applicant of the remedy of a permanent stay of his conviction. When looking at the nature of the breach of the reasonable time guarantee, the offense committed, and balancing the public interest, the redress granted by the Court of Appeal of staying any further imprisonment was appropriate in the circumstances. Your Honor, this brings me to the, so this was the, the fourth ground. Your real um, argument should be, since this is a special leave application, cast in the frame that he has not made out an arguable case that exceptional circumstances exist here that could lead to the question of the conviction. Yes, please, Your Honor. And I think it will be, it will be more obvious when I go into his sixth ground his sixth ground dealt with eight, eight legal points, which I dealt with in detail in my written submissions, which I will just make short mention with reference to now. The first part, point was the additional evidence, which counsel went into in his oral submission here this morning. Sergeant, Sergeant Jackson, who was a ballistic analyst during the course of the investigations, did a ballistic analysis of the gun in question that was used at the time of the commission of the offense. He fired it and he had a warhead and he made a comparison between the striations on his analysis of the fired bullet together with that that was found on the deceased and he came to the 
he testified that it was that gun that was used. He gave that evidence. At a preliminary inquiry, his analyst certificate was tendered, as is done in criminal cases. The analyst certificate for experts are generally tendered. The post-mortem examination report for the doctor is tendered. The doctor is not called, usually. Ballistic examination reports are tendered as was done in this case. And at the trial, the witness is called because the defense is alerted that this witness has done examination and he will be called as a witness at the trial. Uh, can you just help me with something? Are you saying that at the uh, magistrate's court, the report was tendered? Yes, please, Your Honor. By whom, or was it tendered by consent? By the prosecution. I know, but was there any objection? But how was it tendered? Through the prosecution? Was it just tendered from the uh, bar table? The, the, it... round, the police, uh, one of the police would have tendered it in the course of his uh, evidence. He would have uplifted it from the analyst. He would have been around who would have gone to the scene. He would have uplifted would have a firearm. The, the complainant. He would have been the, the... One of the witnesses for the prosecution. And it was not objected to? No, please, Your Honor. Okay, good. So he gave evidence. So the application was made for him to testify at a high court trial in keeping with Yasin and Thomas's case, which is our locus classicus in Guyana, on that issue. And it was permitted. There's also the case of Lawrence Chan and when one looks at the record, you will see that the application was made and those two cases were, were submitted as the evidence, as the authority for making the application. The, the, the judge granted it, the witness was called, and he testified. His that, evidence... Was that the application for additional evidence? Yes, please, Your Honor. I was just going to say that. Framed in the High Court, you framed it as an application for additional evidence. Yes, please, Your Honor. Yeah. But then the judge held the voir dire. Didn't the trial judge hold a voir dire? He had a voir dire in relation to the caution statement. No. Did he not also have a voir dire to determine whether or yes, not... Yes, voir dire, right? Yes, please, Your Honor. So, I'm sorry? Whether or not the ballistic expert had or had not given evidence in the magistrate's court? The application was made. Yeah. It's the privilege that we have. At page 117, please, Your Honor, of the... The, same, the record of the court here. What was before the trial judge was the evidence of the police prosecutor that Jackson testified, prosecutor Edmund Cooper, as against that of the evidence of the legal clerk, Jagrani Pasada, who could not recall whether she gave evidence and did not see any notes of evidence from Jackson. Trial judge held a voir dire and at the conclusion of same exercise his discretion and allowed Jackson to testify. So the voir dire was held, please, Your Honor. Your Honor, this was a lawful decision by the learned trial judge, which was considered by the Court of Appeal in, ex in, in the judge's exercise of a discretion to admit the evidence. And this can be found at page 116, line 18 of the record, all of pages 117, 118, 119, and concluding at 119. Lines 18 to 19, where it was held. We therefore see no reason, and this is the Court of Appeal, to interfere with the trial judge's discretion and to substitute ours for that of the trial judge in allowing the witness Jackson to testify. 
It's my respectful submission that the Court of Appeal was correct in law in finding that there was no reason to interfere with the trial judge's discretion and to substitute theirs for that of a trial judge, whom they had found considered the principles enunciated in Yassin and Thomas's case. Your Honor, in relation to this ground of the additional evidence, there is no evidence, there is no it's my respectful submission that there was no serious miscarriage of justice by the Court of Appeal in their decision. This brings me to the second point, expert evidence. My, learn my learned friend has two contentions. He's contending that Jackson gave additional evidence, one, and secondly, that Jackson's evidence was treated as expert evidence. Jackson, as well as the doctor who performed the post-mortem examination, both of them were experts. They were deemed experts. And expert witnesses can give opinion evidence. And this is one of the issues my learned friend raised with this honorable court when in his oral submissions he had a contention with the analyst given opinion evidence. The issue of expert witnesses evidence was alluded to by the learned trial judge in paragraph 72 and 73 of our written submissions, please, Your Honors, and which was considered by the Court of Appeal at page 120, lines 1 to 8 of the record. Again, Your Honors, it's our respectful submission that there was no serious miscarriage of justice so as to warrant this honorable court granting leave to appeal in relation to the expert evidence and the directions in relation thereto. The directions that were given and they were considered by the Court of Appeal at the hearing of the appeal, following the cases of Bitch and Dean, 26 WIR, as well as Jennifer Swamy's case. Your Honor, this brings me to the next issue that my learned friend has raised in relation to the gross negligence manslaughter. Your Honor, this, Your Honors, this ground was well argued by both the State and the Defense of the Court of Appeal. And this is evident from the record. There was no error in law by the learned trial judge. The State was able to point this out to the Court of Appeal which based its decision, which based on its decision was satisfied that adequate directions were given to the jury by the Honorable Trial Judge. We have referred to this in our written submissions at paragraph 74, please, Your Honor. And then you have page 110, line 6, all of pages 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, and concluding at line 17 on page 116. The Court of Appeal during consideration of gross negligence manslaughter stated, at page 114, lines 14 to 16, we feel therefore that the summing up taken as a whole did convey to the jury what was really required in relation to the elements of the offense and the burden of proof, and therefore we feel no complaint could be made in the circumstances. In relation to this issue, counsel for the applicant has submitted that there are no reported cases from the Caribbean dealing with the issue of gross negligence. Your Honor, gross negligence manslaughter. Your Honors, I beg to differ in this, on this issue. I respectfully submit that the state at the appeal did refer to the Guyana case of Guy Simmons and the Trinidadian case of Williams against the state. 
as was stated at paragraphs 29 to 31 of our written submissions dated the 10th of April 2019. That would have been our submissions in response to the applicant's submissions. My learned friend is fully aware of this because he was there at the Court of Appeal and he would have heard us argue it. My respect for submission, Your Honors, is that in relation to the whole issue of gross negligence manslaughter, there is no evidence before this Honorable Court that there has been any serious miscarriage of justice in relation to this issue as we have submitted in our written submissions. And then there was the same issue of the gross negligence manslaughter and its application to the caution statement and the unsworn statement of the applicant. And judge, the learn child judge did allude to this. And uh, a while ago, the court was asking my learned friend in relation to the caution statement and the the, the, the applicant in his caution statement did admit that he pulled the trigger. And the uh, ballistic analyst testified, and he said that it could not have been done accidentally because five pounds of pressure is required to be applied to the trigger in order for it to be, uh, for the, the gun to be fired. In relation to the caution statement, a volier was also held, Your Honors, in relation to the caution statement, and thereafter the learned trial judge admitted the statement. In the summing up, the, honor, the, the trial judge adequately directed the jury as to the circumstances surrounding the taking of the caution statement. Relevant parts of the summing up was highlighted in our written submissions at paragraph 77. That was in relation to the admissibility. Once again, there is no evidence here that there was any serious miscarriage of justice or that the admissibility of the caution statement, the ruling of the, the trial judge, as well as the ruling of the Court of Appeal on this issue has raised any genuine point of law that is wrong in law that needs to be corrected by this Honorable Court. The sixth issue raised by my learned friend in ground six is elements of the defense of accident. Defense of accident was discussed by the learned trial judge in his summing up, as was mentioned at paragraph 79 of our written submissions page 278, lines 11 to 19, page 280, lines 9 to 30, page 281, lines 1 to 2, page 334, line 30, all of page 335, 336, and 337. And I wish to remind this honorable court of what was said by the learned child judge. He directed the jury, you have seen and heard the witnesses and the statement from the accused who was sitting in the dock. The accused told you that it was an accident. And in his statement from the dock, he explained how it happened. If you accept his explanation, you have to quit him. If you are in doubt, you free him. If you disbelieve, you cannot convict. You have to go back to the prosecution's case. And only if the prosecution satisfies you so that you feel sure you can convict. And this is the appropriate direction. The burden is on the prosecution to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And the issue of accident, we will have to disprove it. And it's my respect for submission that it was done. And my reason 
And the, the evidence to support this is the very verdict of the jury. The jury verdict speaks loud with that conviction that they got the direction, they heard the evidence, they were present in court, they heard the evidence. And in relation to this same issue, my learned friend had raised the issue of accident. I'd like to remind this honorable court of page 280 of the record, where the learned trial judge in his summing up directed the jury. Before I go into the evidence, I must tell you what the law says can amount to an accident. Madam Forewoman and members of the jury, an accident can be said to be an occurrence or an event over which a person has no control in the sense that he has no causal connection with it. This is fully in favor of the, of the defense. In the case of an accident, the person has no guilty mind, no guilty intention. The principle is that once evidence discloses a possibility of that, you, the jurors, would have to consider it. And this plea of accident is a complete defense in law. And it goes in consonance with his direction that if you believe it, you must acquit. If you're in doubt, acquit. If you disbelieve him, do not convict. Go back to the prosecution's case. And only if the prosecution has proven that case so that you feel sure, then you can convict. <clears throat> the Lord trial judge went on further on the same page 280, lines 19 to 26, 21. I should tell you again, there is no burden on the accused person to prove that the injury was accidental. The burden is on the state to prove its case beyond the reasonable doubt. The burden never shifts. May it please your honors, it's pollucidly clear here that this direction was clear and unambiguous. The jury had the benefit of the direction. The jury saw the witnesses. The jury had the benefit of deciding which was another direction that his honor gave to the jury. That in relation to the law, because that was one of the contentions raised by my learned friend a while ago, where he submitted that certain, when the, when the prosecutor was demonstrating and when the prosecutor was addressing the jury, your honors, it's a fair trial. If the prosecutor is demonstrating, the defense can demonstrate. And the defense can, if, if the demonstration by the prosecutor is a misrepresentation of the facts, counsel can object. That's his entitlement. There's no evidence on the record that he objected. And as a point, I'd like to make a submission in relation to the record. The official record is a record of the court. My learned friend raised something that bothers me very, very much about calling the foreman as a witness. The jury's deliberations and their decision is sacrosanct, and we mustn't go behind that. So how are we going to call a juror? What are we calling him to say? What happened in the jury room? So... In, in fairness, I don't think he was suggesting yeah. that. He was suggesting that a juror or a policeman in court could have testified after the fact, after the trial, as to what took place in relation to this particular element. But then we are bound by the court's record. And if that the, the, was so... The, um, DPP, you will believe that the thought occurred to me that the court's record does have a certain gravitas that is not easily gainsaid. And you will have to bring evidence, and you can bring evidence in the Court of Appeal. I did it in the, um, in the, Lusik, in the Mark Royden Williams and uh, Hiles case in the Court of Appeal. 
where there was a certain contention between us and the defense, and we had the affidavit of the judge, which we filed in the Court of Appeal at the hearing of the appeal. That was not done in this case. And the, appeal rec and the court record stands as the authentic document. Please, Your Honors. Can I ask something, Director? The, um, the appellant was represented by one counsel, more than one counsel, were they instructing it? To, what, what was the team? Based on the record, I know Mr. Ramkaran appeared in the High Court. He appeared in the Court of Appeal. Oh, in the, I'm sorry, in the High Court, he appeared on his own? Or did someone appear with him? Pardon me? Together with another lawyer. Uh, Nigel Hawk is on the record as the other lawyer. So what is the practice in Guyana if it is that there is an instructing an advocate attorney or maybe two advocate attorneys and there is an issue that arises. Is it the practice that, uh, or on the director's side, is it the practice that the junior attorney or the instructing attorney may depose to an affidavit um, to describe or explain what may or may not have happened? What, 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 what is the practice if there is a contention in proceedings? as to what transpired in court. That, that, that is, this, this, um, the, the demonstration and so on all go to the, uh, the viability of the record. That basically this is a challenge on this aspect to the viability of the record. Yes, mm -hmm. it is clear that um, they, from what you say, there were at least two attorneys present. Based on the record, please, John. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, in civil proceedings, for example, an instructing attorney may go on oath and depose to, I was present in court and this is what transpired. So, is that a normal practice? It is, Your Honor. And the reason why I'm smiling is my first case I did yeah. when I came out as a young lawyer was before the then Chief Justice Harper, and I never forget. I've never forgotten that that's what happened with me in the, in the case because I had gone to get a witness to get some records in relation to the deceased. I had seen the records, and a witness came to court and told the court that he did not have the records. He was administrator of a hospital. The lady had been burnt by her husband. It was a murder trial we were doing. I could not believe when he stood in the box and he said it. And I was appearing with another counsel and I gave it up. And uh, I was advised by Chief Justice Harper, if you want, you can go into the box and give the evidence. The Lord Senior Counsel do not sing with the lawyer on the other side. So it can happen. And uh, there are few cases where it has happened, and uh, that's my answer to your honor. And you, con you continued on as counsel? No, I, and, it, and I was so upset because I had done the case. We had, it, was a it was a witness we were attempting to lead at the end of the prosecution's case. I wanted to show that he had set her fire. He had said that she was accidentally set a fire, and I wanted to show the degree, she had third degree burns, third degree burns, the second degree burns on 90% of her body when she was taken to the hospital. And I wanted that evidence to go in because the cause of death on the post-mortem examination report said septicemia due to burns. And it didn't give you that detail that from the time she was admitted to the hospital, there were third degree burns to 90% of the body. And obviously if this was an accident and the husband was there all the time, why didn't he try to out the fire? And um, I was prevented from doing a closing address. As you would agree quite properly, sir. Pardon me? As you would agree quite properly. Sir. Yes, please, Your Honor. I suppose what I'm trying to get at is the other attorney whose name you called, who one assumes, if you say was there, would have been present and would have witnessed all of this. And he presumably could have uh, deposed to what he considered to have been 
um, an accurate uh, recollection of what transpired on both the demonstration, the Jura issue, uh, etc. Yeah? Yes, please, Your Honor. Were you, were and you, Your Honor, were you, that, were you sorry. Uh, representing the state at the trial? Yes, I was a new, a new state councillor. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just trying to fit, fit. I'm sorry if I distracted you. So, Your Honor, it's my respectful submission that in relation to the defense of accident, based on a record and uh, our, 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 our quotation, our extracts, the extracts that we have referred to in our written submissions and that I have alluded to a while ago, there is not, there's no evidence that the applicant did not have the benefit of the defense of accident based on the trial judge's directions as well as the Court of Appeals at, uh, um, at attention to that aspect of the appeal. They considered it, they considered it in detail, and they made a detailed reference to it in the record, which is at, included in the record, the transcript from the Court of Appeal. It's my respectful submission, Your Honors, that there was no serious miscarriage of justice in relation to the issue of accident, of the defense of accident at the trial or at the Court of Appeal. The seventh ground was the failure of the trial judge to undertake full and proper investigation into, poss into the possibility of a compromised jury. Your Honor, the record has that the judge did conduct an inquiry. The counsel in this court was the counsel at the trial, and according to the court's record, by consent, the trial continued with 12 jurors. This was a manslaughter trial, and in a manslaughter trial, you could have 11 jurors. And there is no record that there was any objection to the trial judge continuing with the 12 jurors after the inquiry. The record states at page 237, lines 10 to 14, that both counsel for the state and defense counsel consented. It's my respectful submission that it's improper now for counsel to have consented at the trial and then raise it as an issue on the appeal after there's a conviction. And this was considered by this honorable court in the CCJ decision of James Anthony Highland, the DP against, and the case of Williams and the DPP. Paragraph 77 and 78 of the judgment. Yes, in Mary, at, at, sorry. At page 237, it explicitly says in the note that by consent, the juror to continue sitting as a juror in this case. Yes, please, John, because all, all the, the, jury, the juror was questioned in the presence of... Yes. So the inquiry was held. My respectful submission is that there was no serious miscarriage of justice in relation to this issue. The next issue is failure of the trial judge to direct the jury on the disagreement, that a disagreement is possible. The learned trial judge did direct, give directions on the verdict. Section 158 of the Criminal Law Procedure Act, Chapter 1001 states the law on the number of jurors required to find a verdict. For murder, the verdict shall be unanimous. 
for manslaughter and any offense other than a capital offense. There can be a majority verdict, but it has to be a majority of not less than 10 after deliberating for at least two hours. If the deliberations are under two hours, then the verdict has to be unanimous. This was a majority verdict which was delivered after two hours, and this is clear from the record page dealing with the, um, the time. The verdict was a 10 to 2 majority verdict. There is no evidence that any other jurors wished to dissent but did not do so. Those who wished to dissent did do so, and that's why we had a majority verdict. Additionally, there is no evidence that the applicant was robbed of a chance of acquittal. May it please your honors, at page two, 338 of the record, you have line 30, jury, 26, line 31, jury returned, 1559. And when they returned at 1559, they they came back in relation to further directions, and uh, the further directions that they required, the learned child judge gave them directions in relation to the issue. And we turn over to page 339, and it states, line one, jury, re jury returned with a request for further directions. Madam Forewoman, do you need any further assistance? Yes, please, Your Honor. We, the jury, would like further clarification on the law surrounding gross negligence manslaughter. And you have continuing thereon for the balance of that page, page 339, 340. You have um, judges' directions on this issue, 341. And um, the jury retired to, con to, re to consider the verdict. There was a particular direction at 341 which caught my attention, which may have made you cringe, at line 12 on 341, where the judge said, any doubt you have, if you do not satisfy, I guess us believe the defense, you would disregard his defense and go back to the prosecution's case. And if you have a scintilla of doubt, you have to set him free. Your Honor, he, he, he lowered the standard, but that goes in favor of the accused. That's why, that's why I say you must have cringed when you heard um, about the scintilla of doubt. He had the benefit of it. The accused had the benefit of it. And despite that, Your Honor, we still got a, a guilty verdict. Mm -hmm. And it's no, there's no, and it's no wonder that there are no exceptional circumstances. As the Honorable Justice Witt would put it, so as to justify the Court of Appeal allowing the appeal against the conviction. Okay. And the Court of Appeal themselves said, the Court of Appeal had said that the evidence as a whole, I found it, the evidence as a whole was simple. This is page 120 of the record. The evidence as a whole was simple. It was evidence on which a jury properly directed would have come to the conclusion that they did. And we do not feel then that the accused was robbed of a chance of an acquittal. Even if there might have been some errors in relation to the judges summing up. Your Honours, in relation to this gross negligence manslaughter issue, when they came back for further directions, my learned friend is arguing that judge should have given them, the, the trial judge should have given them directions on this agreement. But one has to be very careful. And when a jury comes back, and they come back and they ask for specific directions, directions that are given are in relation to what they come back and they ask for because they have now retired to consider their verdict. And if a judge goes outside of that, as we have seen in cases, you may be hearing that the judge is putting pressure on the jury to return a certain type of verdict, 
whichever direction it goes in. So I would respectfully submit that there was no duty on the judge to have given any directions on disagreement. And he had already given directions in relation to verdict. Your Honours, as was meant, as was stated in the application, ground seven stated that grounds, the grounds issues mentioned in ground six, no, in grounds one to five, that they raise, they raise an issue of ground seven. that there was a serious miscarriage of justice. How much longer Wrong would seven, you... they are... Ms. Sorry? Mrs. Ali, uh, how, how much longer would you be? Pardon me? How much longer will you be? I'm coming to the end here, please, Your Honours. There are points of law of public importance, and I respectfully submit that uh, wrongs one to five, as I have uh, gone into, are not points of public importance upon which it is necessary for this honorable court to adjudicate upon and pronounce definitively. May it please your honors, when we look, I'd like to end by relying on a dicta of the learned Justice Bernard in this court in the case of Dwarka not against the AG. At paragraph 19, it's expected that an application for special leave will be supported by reasonable and not frivolous grounds of appeal. My respect for submission is that there are no reasonable or as, as has also been stated by this honorable court, deserving grounds of appeal raised by the applicant, applicant in relation to the granting of special leave against the conviction which was upheld by the Court of Appeal. And in these circumstances, I respectfully ask this Honorable Court not to grant leave to appeal as there are no grounds, no genuine points of law that need to be corrected. Because if left on a record, will form a bad precedent. Nor is there any evidence of any mis serious miscarriage of justice. Thank you, Your Honors. Yes, thank you very much, Mrs. Ali Hank. Mr. Ramkran, is there anything you wish to say? Just two very short issues, please, Your Honors. Yes. The application for special leave was under Section 6C of the Caribbean Court of Justice Act, which is interpretation of the Constitution, and under Section 6D, which is redress for contravention of the of a fundamental rights. So it's not just interpretation. And I abandoned interpretation in the application for special leave. Uh, on the issue raised by Justice Jamadar, the lawyer appearing with me was Nigel Hawk, who at the time the appeal came up was the Solicitor General of Belize. He and I had not been in contact for many years, and he was not present all of the time that the trial went on specifically in relation to the consent of the juror continuing. I don't believe Mr. Hawke was present. So just to clarify that. Your Honours, unless there is anything else I can assist Your Honours, that would be the reply. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, we will take time to consider, and then we will let you know when we are ready to give our decision.